Section 17 of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 2, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter 6C, Subsection C. Conscience, the Beautiful Soul, Evil and the Forgiveness of It. Part 2 conscience then in its majestic sublimity above any specific law and every content of duty puts whatever content there is into its knowledge and willing it becomes moral genius and originality which takes the inner voice of its immediate knowledge to be a voice divine and since in such knowledge it directly knows existence as well it is divine creative power which contains living force in its very conception it is in itself too divine worship service of god for its action consists in beholding this its own proper divinity this solitary worship this service of god in solitude of soul is at the same time essentially service of god in public on the part of a religious community and pure inward self-knowledge and perception of self pass to being a moment of consciousness to behold itself is to exist objectively and this objective element is the utterance of its knowledge and will in a universal way through such expression the self becomes established and accepted and the act becomes an effective deed a deed carrying out a definite result what gives reality and subsistence to its deed is universal self-consciousness when however conscience finds expression this puts the certainty of itself in the form of pure self and thereby as universal self others let the act hold as valid owing to the explicit terms in which the self is thus expressed and acknowledged to be the essential reality the spirit and the substance of their community are thus the mutual assurance of their conscientiousness of their good intentions the rejoicing over this reciprocal purity of purpose the quickening and refreshment received from the glorious privilege of knowing and of getting expression of fostering and cherishing a state so altogether excellent and desirable so far as this sphere of conscience still distinguishes its abstract consciousness from its self-consciousness its life is merely hid in god god is indeed immediately present to its mind and heart to its self but what is revealed its actual consciousness and the mediating process of this consciousness is to it something other than that hidden inner life and the immediacy of god's presence but with the completion of conscience the distinction between its abstract consciousness and its self-consciousness is done away it knows that the abstract consciousness is just this self this individual self-existence which is certain of itself that the very difference between the terms is abolished in the immediateness of the relation of the self to the ultimate being which when placed outside the self is the abstract essence and the being concealed from it for a relation is mediate when the terms related are not one and the same but each is a different term for the other and is one only with the other in some third term an immediate relation however means in fact nothing else than the unity of the terms having risen above the meaningless position of holding these distinctions which are not distinctions at all to be still such consciousness knows the immediateness of the presence of ultimate being within it to be the unity of that being and its self it thus knows itself to be the living inherent reality and takes its knowledge to be religion which qua knowledge viewed as an object or knowledge with an objective existence is the utterance of the religious communion regarding its own spirit we see then here self-consciousness withdrawn into the inmost retreats of its being with all externality as such gone and vanished from it returned into the intuition of ego as altogether identical with ego an intuition where this ego is all that is essential and all that exists it is absorbed in this conception of itself for it is driven to the extreme limit of its extreme positions and in such a way that the moments distinguished moments through which it is real or still consciousness are not merely for us these bare extremes rather what it is for itself and what to it is inherent and what is for it existence all these moments evaporate into abstractions they have no longer stability 
no substantial existence for this phase of consciousness everything that was hitherto for consciousness essential has reverted into these abstractions when clarified to this degree of transparency consciousness exists in its poorest form and the poverty constituting its sole and only possession is itself a process of disappearance this absolute certainty into which the substance has been resolved is absolute untruth which collapses within itself it is absolute self-consciousness in which consciousness with its relation of self and object is submerged and goes under looking at this absorption and disappearance from within the inherent and essential substance is for consciousness knowledge in the sense of its knowledge being consciousness it is split up into the opposition between itself and the object which is for it the essentially real but this very object is what is perfectly transparent is itself and its consciousness is merely knowledge concerning itself all life and all spiritual truth have returned into this self and have lost their difference from the ego the moments of consciousness are therefore these extreme abstractions of which none holds its ground but each loses itself in the other and produces it we have here the process of the unhappy soul in restless change with self in the present case however this is a conscience experience going on inside itself fully conscious of being the notion of reason while the unhappy soul above spoken of was only reason implicitly the absolute certainty of self thus finds itself qua consciousness converted directly into a dying sound a mere objectification of its subjectivity or self-existence but this world so created is the utterance of its own voice which in like manner it has directly heard and the echo of which only returns to it this return does not therefore mean that the self is there in its true reality an und für sich for the real is for it not an inherent being is not per se but its very self just as little has consciousness itself existence for the objective aspect does not succeed in becoming something negative of the actual self in the same way as this self does not reach complete actuality it lacks force to externalize itself the power to make itself a thing and endure existence it lives in dread of staining the radiance of its inner being by action and existence and to preserve the purity of its heart it flees from contact with actuality and steadfastly perseveres in a state of self-willed impotence to renounce a self which is pared away to the last point of abstraction and to give itself substantial existence or in other words to transform its thought into being and commit itself to absolute distinction that between thought and being the hollow object which it produces now fills it therefore with the feeling of emptiness its activity consists in yearning it merely loses itself in becoming an unsubstantial shadowy object and rising above this loss and falling back on itself finds itself merely as lost in this transparent purity of its moments it becomes a sorrow-laden beautiful soul as it is called its light dims and dies within it and it vanishes as a shapeless vapour dissolving into thin air this silent fusion of the pithless unsubstantial elements of evaporated life has however still to be taken in the other sense of the reality of conscience and in the way its process actually appears conscience has to be considered as acting the objective moment in this phase of consciousness took above the determinate form of universal consciousness the knowing of self is qua this particular self different from another self language in which all reciprocally recognize and acknowledge each other as acting conscientiously this general equality breaks up into the inequality of each individual existing for himself each consciousness turns from its universality back into itself each is just as much reflected absolutely into itself as it is universal by this means there necessarily comes about the opposition of individuality to other individuals and to the universal and this relation and its procedure we have to consider or again this universality and duty have the absolutely opposite significance they signify determinate individuality 
exempting itself from what is universal individuality which looks on pure duty as universality that has appeared merely on the surface and is turned on its outside duty is merely a matter of words and passes for that whose being is for something else conscience which in the first instance takes up merely a negative attitude towards duty qua a given determinate duty feels itself detached from it but since conscience fills empty duty with the determinate content drawn from its own self it is positively aware of the fact that it qua this particular self makes its own content its pure self as it is empty knowledge is without content and without definiteness the content which it supplies to that knowledge is drawn from its own self qua this determinate self is drawn from itself as a natural individuality in speaking of the conscientiousness of its action it is doubtless aware of its pure self but in the purpose of its action a purpose which brings in a concrete content it is conscious of itself as this particular individual and is conscious of the opposition between what it is for itself and what it is for others of the opposition of universality or duty and its state of being reflected into self away from the universal while in this way the opposition into which conscience passes when it acts finds expression in its inner life the opposition is at the same time disparity on its outer side in the sphere of existence the disparity or discordance of its particular individuality with reference to another individual its special peculiarity consists in the fact that the two elements constituting its consciousness that is the self and the inherent nature an sich, are unequal in value and significance within it in being accepted as valid they are so determined that certainty of self is the essential fact as against the inherent nature or the universal which is taken to be merely a moment over against this internal determination there thus stands the element of existence the universal consciousness and for this latter it is rather universality duty which is the essential fact while well, individuality which exists for itself and is opposed to the universal has merely the value of a superseded moment the first consciousness is held to be evil by the consciousness which thus stands by the fact of duty because of the lack of congruity or identity of its internal subjective life with the universal and since at the same time the first consciousness declares its act to be identity with itself to be duty and conscientiousness it is held by that universal consciousness to be hypocrisy the course taken by this opposition is in the first instance the formal reinstatement of its identity between what the evil consciousness is in its own nature and what it declares itself to be it has to be made manifest that it is evil and its objective existence thus made congruent with its real nature the hypocrisy must be unmasked this return of the disparity present in hypocrisy into the state of congruency or identity is not at once brought to pass by the mere fact that as people usually say hypocrisy just proves its reverence for duty and virtue through assuming the appearance of them and using this as a mask to hide itself from its own consciousness no less than from another as if in this acknowledgment and recognition in itself of its opposite eo ipso congruency and agreement were implied and contained yet even then it is just as truly done with this recognition in words and is reflected into self and in the very fact of its using the inherent and essential reality merely as something which has a significance for another consciousness there is really implied its own contempt for that inherent principle and the demonstration of the worthlessness of that reality for all for what lets itself be used as an external instrument shows itself to be a thing which has within it no proper weight and worth of its own moreover this congruency or identity is not brought about either by the evil consciousness persisting one-sidedly in its own state or by the judgment of the universal consciousness if the former disclaims the consciousness of duty and maintains that what the latter pronounces to be baseness to be absolute discordance with universality is an action according to inner law and conscience 
then in this one-sided assurance of identity and concord there still remains its want of agreement with the other since this other universal consciousness certainly does not believe the assurance and does not acknowledge it in other words since one-sided insistence on one extreme destroys itself evil would indeed thereby confess to being evil but in so doing would at once cancel itself and cease to be hypocrisy and so would not qua hypocrisy be unmasked it confesses itself in fact to be evil by asserting that while opposing what is recognized as universal it is acting according to inner law and conscience for were this law and conscience not the law of its particularity and caprice it would not be something inward something private but what is universally accepted and acknowledged when therefore any one says he acts towards others from a law and conscience of his own he is saying in point of fact that he is abusing and wronging them but actual conscience is not this insistence on our knowledge and the will which are opposed to what is universal the universal is the element of its existence and its very language pronounces its action to be recognized duty just as little when a universal consciousness emphasizes and persists in its own judgment does this unmask and dissipate hypocrisy when that universal consciousness stigmatizes hypocrisy as bad base and so on it appeals in passing such a judgment to its own law just as the evil consciousness on its side does too for the former law makes its appearance in opposition to the latter and thereby is a particular law it has therefore no antecedent claim over the other law rather it legitimizes this other law hence the universal consciousness by thus emulating the other does precisely the opposite of what it means to do for it shows that its so-called true duty which ought to be universally acknowledged is something not acknowledged and recognized and consequently it grants the other an equal right of independently existing on its own account this judgment of universal consciousness however has at the same time another side to it from which it leads the way to the dissolution of the opposition in question consciousness of the universal does not proceed qua real and qua acting to deal with the evil consciousness for this latter rather is the real in opposing the latter it is a consciousness which is not entangled in the opposition of particular and universal involved in action it stays within the universality of thought takes up the attitude of an apprehending intelligence and its first act is merely that of judgment through this judgment it now places itself as was just observed alongside the first consciousness and the latter through this identity this likeness between them comes to see itself in this other consciousness for in the attitude of apprehension consciousness of duty is passive thereby it is in contradiction with itself as the absolute will of duty as the self that determines absolutely from itself it may well preserve itself in its purity for it does not act it is hypocrisy which wants to see the fact of judging taken for the actual deed and instead of proving its uprightness and honesty by acts does so by expressing fine sentiments it is thus constituted entirely in the same way as that against which the reproach is made of putting its phrases in place of duty in both cases alike the aspect of reality is distinct from the expressed statements in the one case owing to the selfish purpose of the action in the other through failure to act at all a result which is inevitable when there is mere talk about duty for duty without deeds is altogether meaningless the act of judging however has also to be looked at as a positive act of thought and has a positive content this aspect makes the contradiction present in the apprehending consciousness and this identity with the first consciousness still more complete the active consciousness declares its specific deed to be its duty and the consciousness that passes judgment cannot deny this for duty as such is form void of all content and capable of any in other words concrete action inherently implying diversity in its many-sidedness involves the universal aspect which is that which is taken as duty just as much as the particular which constitutes the share and interest the individual has in the act 
the consciousness expressing its judgment does not now stop at the former aspect of duty and rest content with the knowledge which the active agent has of this that is that this is its duty the condition and the status of its reality it holds on to the other aspect diverts the act into the inner realm and explains the act from selfish motives and from its inner intention an intention different from the act itself as every act is capable of treatment in respect of its dutifulness so too each can be considered from this other point of view of particularity for as an act it is the actuality of an individual this process of judging then takes the act out of the sphere of its objective existence and turns it back into that of the inner realm into the form of specific and individual particularity if the act carries glory with it then the inner aspect is judged as love of fame if it altogether fits in with the position and status of the individual without going beyond this position and is so constituted that the individuality in question does not have the position hanging on to it as an external appendage but through itself supplies the content to this universality and by that very process shows itself to be capable of a higher status then the inner nature of the act is judged as ambition and so on since in the act in general the individual who acts comes to see himself in objective form or gets the feeling of his own being in his objective existence and thus attains enjoyment the judgment on the act finds the inner nature of it to be an impulse towards personal and private happiness even though this happiness were to consist merely in inner moral vanity the enjoyment of a sense of personal excellence and in the foretaste and hope of a happiness to come no act can escape being judged in such a way for duty for duty's sake this bare purpose is something unreal what reality it has lies in the deed of some individuality and the action thereby has in it the aspect of particularity no hero is a hero to his valet not however because the hero is not a hero but because the valet is the valet with whom the hero has to do not as a hero but as a man who eats drinks and dresses who in short appears as a particular individual with certain personal wants and idiosyncrasies in the same way there is no act in which that process of judgment cannot oppose the particular aspect of the individuality to the universal aspect of the act and set the valet of morality against the hero who does the act the consciousness that so passes judgment is in consequence itself base and mean because it divides the act up and brings out and holds on to its innermost inconsistency and self-discordance it is furthermore hypocrisy because it gives out this way of judging not as another fashion of being wicked but as the correct consciousness of the act sets itself up in its unreality in this vanity of knowing well and better far above the deed it decries and wants to find its mere words without deeds taken for an admirable kind of reality on this account then putting itself on a level with the agent on whom it passes judgment it is recognized by the latter as the same as himself this latter does not merely find himself apprehended as something alien or external to and unlike or discordant with that other but rather finds the other in its peculiar constitutive character identical with himself seeing this similarity and giving this expression he openly declares himself to the other and expects in like manner that the other having in point of fact put itself on the same level will respond in the same terms on its side will give voice to the likeness found within it and that thus the state of mutual recognition will be brought about his confession is not an attitude of abasement or humiliation before the other is not flinging himself away for to give the matter expression in this way has not the one-sided character which would fix and establish his disparity with the other on the contrary it is solely because of seeing the likeness of the other to him that he gives himself utterance in making his confession he announces from his side their common likeness and does so for the reason that language is the existence of spirit as an immediate self he thus expects that the other will make its own contribution to this manner of existence 
but the admission on the part of the one who is wicked i am so is not followed by a reply making a similar confession this was not what that way of judging meant at all far from it it repels this community of nature and is the hard-heartedness which keeps to itself and rejects all continuity with the other by so doing the scene is changed the one who made the confession sees himself thrust off and takes the other to be in the wrong when he refuses to let his own inner nature go forth in the objective shape of an express utterance opposes and contrasts the beauty of his own soul with the wicked individual and opposes to the confession of the penitent the stiff-necked attitude of the self-consistent equable character and the rigid silence of one who keeps himself to himself and refuses to throw himself away for some one else here we find asserted the highest pitch of revolt to which a spirit certain of itself can reach for it beholds itself qua this bare self-knowledge in another conscious being and in such a way that the external form of this other is not an unessential thing as in the case of an object of wealth but thought knowledge itself is what is opposed to it it is this absolutely unbroken continuity of pure knowledge which refuses to establish communication with an other which had ipso facto by making its confession renounced separate isolated self-existence had affirmed its particularity to be cancelled and thereby established itself as continuous with the other that is established itself as universal the other however retains in its own case and reserves to itself its uncommunicative isolated independence in the case of the individual making the confession it retains just the very thing which that individual has already cast away it thereby proves itself to be a form of consciousness which has forsaken and denies the very nature of spirit for it does not understand that spirit in the absolute certainty of itself is master and lord over every deed and over all reality and can reject and cast them off and make them as if they had never been at the same time it does not see the contradiction it is committing in not allowing a rejection which has been made in express language to pass for genuine rejection while itself has the certainty of its own spiritual life not in a concrete real act but in its inner nature and finds the objective existence of this inner being in the mere utterance of its own judgment it is thus its own self which checks that other's return from the act to the spiritual objectivity of spoken utterance and to spiritual identity and agreement and by its stiffness produces the discordance and dissimilarity which still remain now so far as the spirit which is certain of itself in the form of a beautiful soul does not possess the faculty of relinquishing the self-absorbed uncommunicative knowledge of itself it cannot attain to any identity with the consciousness that is repulsed and so cannot succeed in seeing the unity of itself in another life cannot reach objective existence the equality comes about therefore merely in a negative way as a state of being devoid of spiritual character the beautiful soul then has no concrete reality it subsists in the contradiction between its pure self and the necessity felt by this self to externalize itself and turn into something actual it exists in the immediacy of this rooted and fixed opposition an immediacy which alone is the middle term mediating and reconciling an opposition which has arisen to its pure abstraction and is pure being or empty nothingness thus the beautiful soul being conscious of this contradiction in its unreconciled immediacy is unhinged disordered and runs to madness passes away in yearning and is consumed in pining inanition thereby it gives up as a fact its stubborn insistence on its own isolated self-existence but only to bring forth the soulless spiritless unity of abstract being the true that is to say the self-conscious and actual balance or adjustment of the two sides is necessitated by and already contained in the foregoing breaking the hard heart and raising it to the level of universality is the same process which appeared in the case of the consciousness that expressly made its confession 
the wounds of that spirit heal and leave no scars behind the deed is not something imperishable the spirit takes it back into itself and the aspect of particularity present in it whether in the form of an intention or of an existential negativity and limitation immediately passes away the process of actually realizing self the form of its act is merely a moment of the whole and the same is true of the knowledge functioning through judgment and establishing and maintaining the distinction between the particular and universal aspects of action the evil consciousness spoken of definitely yields up and relinquishes itself or sets itself down as a moment being drawn into the way of express confession by seeing itself in another this other however must have its one-sided unaccepted and unacknowledged judgment broken down just as the former has to abandon its one-sided unacknowledged existence in the state of particularity and isolation and as the former displays the power of spirit over its reality so this other must manifest the power of spirit over its constitutive and determinate notion the latter however renounces thought that divides and separates and the rigid imperviousness of uncommunicative self-existence for the reason that in point of fact it sees itself in the first that which in this way abandons its reality and makes itself into a superseded particular this diesen shows itself thereby to be in fact universal it turns away from its external reality back into itself as inner essence and there the universal consciousness thus knows and finds itself the forgiveness it extends to the first is the renunciation of self of its unreal being since it identifies this unreal nature and what other element of real action and recognizes what was called bad a determination assigned to action by thought to be good or rather it lets go and gives up this distinction of determinate thought with its self-determining isolated judgment just as the other foregoes determining the act in isolation and for its own private behoof the word of reconciliation is the objectively existent spirit which sees and immediately apprehends the pure knowledge of itself qua universal being in its opposite in the pure knowledge of itself qua absolutely self-confined single individual a reciprocal recognition which is absolute spirit absolute spirit enters existence merely at the culminating point at which its pure knowledge about itself is the opposition and interchange with itself knowing that its pure knowledge is the abstract essential reality absolute spirit is this knowing duty in absolute opposition to the knowledge which knows itself qua absolute singleness of self to be the essentially real the former is the pure continuity of the universal which knows the individuality that thinks itself the real to be inherently null and not to be evil the latter again is absolute discreteness which thinks itself absolute in its pure oneness and thinks the universal is the unreal which exists only for others both aspects are refined and clarified to this degree of purity where there is no selfless existence left no negative of consciousness in either of them where instead the one element of duty is the self-identical character of its self-knowledge and the other element of evil equally has its purpose in its own inner being and its reality in its own mode of utterance the content of this utterance is the substance that gives it subsistence the utterance is the assurance and asseveration of the certainty of spirit within its own self these spirits both certain of themselves have each no other purpose than its own pure self and no other reality and existence than just this pure self but they are still different and the difference is absolute because holding within this element of the pure notion the difference is absolute too not merely for us tracing the experience but for the notions themselves which stand in this opposition for while these notions are indeed determinate and specific relatively to one another they are at the same time in themselves universal so that they compass the whole range of the self and this self can have no other content than this its own determinate constitution 
which neither transcends the self nor is more restricted than it for the one aspect the absolutely universal is pure self-knowledge as well as the other the absolute discreteness of single individuality and both are merely this pure self-knowledge both determinate aspects then are cognitive pure notions which know qua notions whose very constitution consists in immediately knowing or in other words whose relationship and opposition is the ego because of this they are for one another these absolutely opposed elements it is what is completely inner that has in this way come into opposition to itself and entered objective existence they constitute pure knowledge which owing to this opposition takes the form of consciousness but as yet it is not self-consciousness it obtains this actualization in the course of the process through which this opposition passes for this opposition is really itself the indiscreet continuity and identity of ego equals ego and each by itself inherently cancels itself just through the contradiction in its pure universality which while implying continuity and identity at the same time still resists its identity with the other and separates itself from it through this relinquishment of separate selfhood the knowledge which in its existence is in a state of diremption returns into the unity of the self it is the concrete actual ego universal knowledge of self in its absolute opposite in the knowledge which is internal to and within the self and which because of the very purity of its separate subjective existence is itself completely universal the reconciling affirmation the yes with which both egos desist from their existence in opposition is the existence of the ego expanded into a duality an ego which remains therein one and identical with itself and possesses the certainty of itself in its complete relinquishment and its opposite it is god appearing in the midst of those who know themselves in the form of pure knowledge End of section seventeen. Section eighteen of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume Two, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter Seven, Religion. Translator's Note the appearance of absolute spirit as a principle constituting on its own account a distinctive stage of experience is at once a demand of the preceding development and a condition of making experience self-complete finite or socialized spiritual existence is at its best incapable of establishing the truth that spirit is the only reality for the more finite spirit approximates to the state of claiming to be self-contained the more it is dependent on universal self-consciousness a trans-finite or absolute spiritual being as such is thus necessary to realize and sustain the fullness of meaning which finite spirit possesses moreover if the truth is the whole and only so is truth self-complete and self-explaining and if reality is essentially spiritual then experience only finds its complete meaning realized in the principle of absolute spirit hence the final stage of the phenomenology of experience is the appearance therein of absolute spirit moreover absolute spirit in its own distinctive existence could only appear at the end of the process of experience for the whole of that process is required to reveal and to constitute the substance of which the absolute consists but the peculiarity of the stage now reached is that here the absolute operates in its undivided totality to form a definite type of experience or in the language of the text we have the absolute here conscious of its self no doubt in all the previous stages consciousness self-consciousness reason spirit the absolute has been implied as a limiting principle at once substantiating and determining the boundaries of each stage hence each stage had an absolute of its own the character of which was derived in each case from the peculiarity of the stage in question now however we have the absolute by itself 
in its single self-completeness as the sole formative factor of a certain type of experience the absolute then in its own self-complete reality appears as the constitutive principle of experience the experience here is the self-consciousness of absolute spirit it appears to itself in all its objects since all the modes of finitude hitherto considered consciousness self-consciousness etc are embraced in its single totality it may use each and all of these various modes as the media through and in which to appear when it appears in and through these modes of finitude we have the attitude of religion since these modes as we saw differ the religious attitude differs and accordingly we have various types or forms of religion each of these forms in and through which the absolute appears is circumscribed in its nature and process each is per se inadequate to the revelation of complete absolute self-consciousness hence the variety of religions is necessitated by and is indirectly due to the failure of any one type and the inadequacy of every single type to reveal the absolute completely a form of appearance or self-manifestation of the absolute is therefore demanded which will reveal absolute spirit adequately to itself as it essentially is in itself here it will know itself so to say face to face and with perfect completeness this form is absolute knowledge hence religion and absolute knowledge are the final stages in the argument of the phenomenology the former is dealt with in the immediately succeeding section seven and its various subsections the latter forms the subject of the concluding section eight of the work end of translator's note chapter seven religion in general in the forms of experience hitherto dealt with which are distinguished broadly as consciousness self-consciousness reason and spirit religion also the consciousness of absolute being in general has no doubt made its appearance but that was from the point of view of consciousness when it has the absolute being for its object absolute being however in its own distinctive nature the self-consciousness of spirit has not appeared in those forms even at the plane of consciousness that is when this takes the shape of understanding there is a consciousness of the supersensuous of the inner being of objective existence but the supersensible the eternal or whatever we care to call it is devoid of selfhood it is merely to begin with something universal which is a long way still from being spirit knowing itself as spirit then there was self-consciousness which came to its final shape in the bereft soul the unhappy consciousness that was merely the pain and sorrow of spirit wrestling to get itself out into objectivity once more but not succeeding the unity of individual self-consciousness with its unchangeable being which is what this stage arrives at remains in consequence a beyond something afar off the immediate existence of reason which we found arising out of that state of sorrow and the special shapes which reason assumes have no form of religion because self-consciousness in the case of reason knows itself or looks for itself in the direct and immediate present on the other hand in the world of the ethical order we met with a type of religion the religion of the netherworld this is belief in the fearful and unknown darkness of fate and in the humanities of the spirit of the departed the former being pure negation taking the form of universality the latter the same negation but in the form of particularity absolute being is then in the latter shape no doubt the self and is present as there is no other way for the self to be except present but the particular self is this particular ghostly shade which keeps the universal element fate separated from itself it is indeed a shade a ghost a cancelled and superseded particular and so a universal self but that negative meaning has not yet turned round into this latter positive significance and hence the self so cancelled and transcended still directly means at the same time this particular being this insubstantial reality 
fate however without self remains the darkness of night devoid of consciousness which never comes to draw distinctions within itself and never attains the clearness of self-knowledge this belief in a necessity that produces nothingness this belief in the nether world becomes belief in heaven because the self which has departed must be united with its universal nature must unfold what it contains in terms of this universality and thus becomes clear to itself this kingdom of belief however we saw unfold its content merely in the element of reflective thought denken without bringing out the true notion begriff and we saw it on that account perish in its final fate that is in the religion of enlightenment here in this type of religion the supersensible beyond which we found in understanding is reinstated again but in such a way that self-consciousness rests and feels satisfied in the mundane present not in the beyond and thinks of the supersensible beyond void and empty unknowable and devoid of all terrors neither as a self nor as power and might in the religion of morality it is at last reinstated that absolute reality is a positive content but that content is bound up with the negativity characteristic of the enlightenment the content is an objective being which is at the same time taken back into the self and remains there enclosed and is a content with internal distinctions while its parts are just as immediately negated as they are posited the final destiny however which absorbs this contradictory process is the self conscious of itself as the controlling necessity schicksal of what is essential and actual spirit knowing its self is in religion primarily and immediately its own pure self-consciousness those modes of it above considered objective spirit spirit estranged from itself and spirit certain of itself together constitute what it is in its condition of consciousness the state in which being objectively opposed to its own world it does not therein apprehend and consciously possess itself but in conscience it brings itself as well as its objective world as a whole into subjection as also its idea and its various specific conceptions and is now self-consciousness at home with itself here spirit represented as an object has the significance for itself of being universal spirit which contains within itself all that is ultimate and essential and all that is concrete and actual yet is not in the form of freely subsisting actuality or of the detached independence of external nature it has a shape no doubt the form of objective being in that it is object of its own consciousness but because this being is put forward in religion with the essential character of being self-consciousness the form or shape assumed is one perfectly transparent to itself and the reality spirit contains is enclosed in it or transcended in it just in the same way as when we speak of all reality its reality is universal reality in the sense of a product of thought since then in religion the peculiar characteristic of what is properly consciousness of spirit does not have the form of detached and external otherness the existence of spirit is distinct from its self-consciousness and its actual reality proper falls outside religion there is no doubt one spirit in both but its consciousness does not embrace both together and religion appears as a part of existence of acting and of striving whose other part is the life lived within its own actual world and we now know that spirit in its own world and spirit conscious of itself as spirit that is spirit in the sphere of religion are the same the completion of religion consists in the two forms becoming identical with one another not merely in its reality being grasped and embraced by religion but conversely it as spirit conscious of itself becomes actual to itself and real object of its own consciousness so far as spirit in religion presents itself to itself it is indeed consciousness and the reality enclosed within it is the shape and garment in which it clothes its idea of itself the reality however does not in this presentation get proper justice done to it that is to say it does not get to be an independent and free objective existence and not merely a garment 
and conversely because that reality lacks within itself its completion it is a determinate shape or form which does not attain to what it ought to reveal that is spirit conscious of itself that its form might express spirit itself the form would have to be nothing else than spirit and spirit would have to appear to itself or to be actual as it is in its own essential being only thereby too would be attained what may seem to demand the opposite that the object of its consciousness has at the same time the form of free and independent reality but only spirit which is object to itself in the shape of absolute spirit is as much aware of being a free and independent reality as it remains therein conscious of itself since in the first instance self-consciousness and consciousness simply religion and spirit as it is externally in its world or the objective existence of spirit are distinct the latter consists in the totality of spirit so far as its moments are separated from each other and each is set forth by itself these moments however are consciousness self-consciousness reason and spirit spirit that is qua immediate spirit which is not yet consciousness of spirit its totality taken altogether constitutes the mundane existence of spirit as a whole spirit as such contains the previous separate embodiments in the form of universal determinations of its own being in those moments just named religion presupposes that these have completely run their course and is their simple totality their absolute self and soul the course which these traverse is moreover in relation to religion not to be pictured as a temporal sequence it is only spirit in its entirety that is in time and the shapes assumed which are specific embodiments of the whole of spirit as such present themselves in a sequence one after the other for it is only the whole which properly has reality and hence the form of pure freedom relatively to anything else the form which takes expression as time but the moments of the whole consciousness self-consciousness reason and spirit have because they are moments no existence separate from one another just as spirit was distinct from its moments we have further in the third place to distinguish from these moments their specific individuated character each of those moments in itself we saw broke up again in a process of development all its own and took various shapes and forms as for example in the case of consciousness sensuous certainty and perception were distinct phases these latter aspects fall apart in time from one another and belong to a specific particular whole for spirit descends from its universality to assume an individual form through specification by determination this determination or mediate element is consciousness self-consciousness and so on now the forms assumed by these moments constitute individuality hence these exhibit and reveal spirit in its individually or concrete reality and are distinguished in time from one another though in such a way that the succeeding retains within it the preceding while therefore religion is the completion of the life of spirit its final and complete expression into which as being their ground its individual moments consciousness self-consciousness reason and spirit return and have returned they at the same time together constitute the objectively existing realization of spirit in its totality as such spirit is real only as the moving process of these aspects which it possesses a process of distinguishing them and returning back into itself in the process of these universal moments is contained the development of religion generally since however each of these attributes was set forth and presented not only in the way it in general determines itself but as it is in and for itself that is as within its own being running its course as a distinct whole there has thus arisen not merely the development of religion generally those independently complete processes pursued by the individual phases and stages of spirit contain at the same time the determinate forms of religion itself spirit in its entirety spirit in religion is once more the process from its immediacy to the attainment of a knowledge of what it implicitly or immediately is and is the process of attaining the state where the shape and form in which it appears as an object for its own consciousness 
will be perfectly identical with and adequate to its essential nature and where it will behold itself as it is in this development of religion then spirit itself assumes definite forms which constitute the distinctions involved in this process and at the same time a determinate or specific form of religion has likewise an actual spirit of a specific character thus if consciousness self-consciousness reason and spirit belong to self-knowing spirit in general in a similar way the specific shapes which self-knowing spirit assumes appropriate and adopt the distinctive forms which were specifically developed in the cage of each of the stages consciousness self-consciousness reason and spirit the determinate shape assumed in a given case by religion appropriates from among the forms belonging to each of its moments the one adapted to it and makes this its actual spirit this one determinate attitude of religion pervades and permeates all aspects of its actual existence and stamps them with this common feature in this way the arrangement now assumed by the forms and shapes which have thus far appeared is different from the way they appeared in their own order on this point we may note shortly at the outset what is of chief importance in the series we considered each moment exhaustively elaborating its entire content evolved and formed itself into a single whole within its own peculiar principle and knowledge was the inner death or the spirit wherein the elements having no subsistence of their own possessed their substance this substance however has now at length made its appearance it is the deep life of spirit certain of itself it does not allow the principle belonging to each individual form to get isolated and become a whole within itself rather it collects all these moments into its own content keeps them together and advances within this total wealth of its concrete actual spirit while all its particular moments take into themselves and receive together in common the like determinate character of the whole this spirit certain of itself and the process it goes through this is their true reality the independent self-subsistence which belongs to each individually thus while the previous linear series in its advance marked the retrogressive steps in it by knots but thence went forward again in one linear stretch it is now as it were broken at these knots these universal moments and radiates into many lines which being bound together into a single bundle combine at the same time symmetrically so that the similar distinctions in which each separately took shape within its own sphere meet together for the rest it is self-evident from the whole argument how this coordination of universal directions just mentioned is to be understood so that it becomes superfluous to remark that these distinctions are to be taken to mean essentially and only moments of the process of development not parts in the case of actual concrete spirit they are attributes of its substance in religion on the other hand they are only predicates of the subject in the same way indeed all forms in general are in themselves or for us contained in spirit and contained in every spirit but the main point of importance in dealing with its reality is solely what determinate character it has in its consciousness in which specific character it has expressed itself or in what shape it knows its essential nature the distinction made between actual spirit and that same spirit which knows itself as spirit or between itself qua consciousness and qua self-consciousness is transcended and done away with in the case where spirit knows itself in its real truth its consciousness and its self-consciousness have come to terms but as religion is here to begin with and immediately this distinction has not yet reverted to spirit it is merely the conception the principle of religion that is established at first in this the essential element is self-consciousness which is conscious of being all truth and which contains all reality within that truth this self-consciousness being consciousness and so aware of an object has itself for its object spirit which knows itself in the first instance immediately is thus to itself spirit in the form of immediacy 
and the specific character of the shape in which it appears to itself is that of pure simple being this being this bare existence has indeed a filling drawn neither from sensation or manifold matter nor from any other one-sided elements purposes and determinations its filling is solely spirit and is known by itself to be all truth and reality such filling is in this first form not in agreement or identity with its own shape spirit qua ultimate reality is not in accord with its consciousness it is actual only as absolute spirit when it is also to itself in its truth as it is in its certainty of itself or when the extremes into which spirit qua consciousness falls exist for one another in spiritual shape the embodiment adopted by spirit qua object of its own consciousness remains filled by the certainty of spirit and this self-certainty constitutes its substance through this content the degrading of the object to bare objectivity to the form of something that negates self-consciousness disappears the immediate unity of spirit with itself is the fundamental basis or pure consciousness inside which consciousness breaks up into its constituent elements that is an object with subject over against it in this way shut up within its pure self-consciousness spirit does not exist in religion as the creator of a nature in general rather what it produces in the course of this process are its forms and shapes qua spirits which together constitute all that it can reveal when it is completely manifested and this process itself is the development of its perfect and complete actuality through the individual aspects thereof that is through its imperfect modes of realization the first realization of spirit is just the principle and notion of religion itself religion as immediate and thus natural religion here spirit knows itself as its object in a natural or immediate shape the second realization is however necessarily that of knowing itself in the shape of transcended and superseded natural existence that is in the form of self this is the religion of art or productive activity for the shape it adopts is raised to the form of self through the productive activity of consciousness by which this consciousness beholds in its object its own action that is sees the self the third realization finally cancels the one-sidedness of the first two the self is as much an immediate self as the immediacy is a self if spirit in the first is in the form of consciousness and in the second in that of self-consciousness it is in the third in the form of the unity of both it has then the shape of what is completely self-contained an und für sich seins and since it is thus presented as it is in and for itself this is the sphere of revealed religion although spirit however here reaches its true shape the very shape assumed and the conscious presentation are an aspect and phase still unsurmounted and from this spirit has to pass over into the life of the notion in order therein completely to resolve the form of objectivity in the notion which embraces within itself this its own opposite it is then that spirit has grasped its own principle the notion of itself as so far only we who analyze spirit have grasped it and its form the element of its existence since this form is the notion is then spirit itself End of section 18. Section 19 of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 2, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter 7a Natural Religion. Translator's Note the arrangement of the analysis of religion and the divisions into the various subsections are as indicated in the preceding note page six hundred and eighty three determined by the general development of experience that development is from the immediate through mediation to the fusion of immediacy and mediation the stages of the development of experience are consciousness self-consciousness reason the latter leading to its highest level 
finite spiritual existence the development of religion follows these various ways in which objects are given in experience and the three chief divisions of religion are determined accordingly natural religion is religion at the level of consciousness art religion at the level of self-consciousness revealed religion is religion at the level of reason and spirit each of these is again subdivided and the subdivision follows more or less closely the various subdivisions of these three ultimate levels of experience consciousness etc thus in natural religion we have religion at the level of sense certainty light religion at the level of perception life and religion at the level of understanding the reciprocal relation constituted by the play of forces appears as the relation of the artificer to his own product the general principle is not worked out in detail with the same obviousness in the case of the other two primary types of religion art and revealed religion but the same general method of development is pursued in these cases the historical material before the mind of the writer is as might be expected the various religions which have historically appeared amongst mankind these religions are treated however as illustrations of principles dominating the religious consciousness in general rather than as merely historical phenomena with the succeeding argument should be read hegel's philosophy of religion part two sections one and two and part three end of translator's note chapter seven a natural religion spirit knowing spirit is consciousness of itself and is to itself in the form of objectivity it is and is at the same time self-existence fur sich sein it is for self it is the aspect of self-consciousness and is so in contrast to the aspect of its consciousness the aspect by which it relates itself to itself as object in its consciousness there is the opposition and in consequence the specificity of the form in which it appears to itself and knows itself it is with this specificity that we have alone to do in considering religion for its essential unspecified principle its abstract notion has already come to light the distinction of consciousness and self-consciousness however falls at the same time within this notion the form or shape of religion does not contain the existence of spirit in the sense of its being nature detached and free from thought nor in the sense of its being thought detached from existence the shape assumed by religion is existence contained and preserved in thought as well as a thought content which is consciously existent it is by the determinate character of this form in which spirit knows itself that one religion is distinguished from another but we have at the same time to note that the systematic exposition of this knowledge about itself in terms of this particular specific character does not as a fact exhaust the whole meaning of a given actual religion the series of different religions which will come before us just as much set forth again merely the different aspects of a single religion and indeed of every particular religion and the ideas the conscious processes which seem to mark off one concrete religion from another make their appearance in each all the same the diversity must also be looked at as a diversity of religion for while spirit lives in the distinction of its consciousness and its self-consciousness the process it goes through finds its goal in the transcendence of this fundamental distinction and in giving the form of self-consciousness to the given shape which is object of consciousness this distinction however is not eo ipso transcended by the fact that the shapes which that consciousness contains have also the element of self in them and that god is represented as self-consciousness the consciously presented self is not the actual concrete self in order that this like every other more specific determination of the form may in truth belong to this form it has partly to be put into this form by the action of self-consciousness and partly the lower determination must show itself to be cancelled and transcended and comprehended by the higher for what is consciously presented vorgestellt only ceases to be something presented and alien external to which knowledge by the self having produced it 
and so viewing the determination of the object as its own determination and hence seeing itself in that object by this operation the lower determination that of being something presented has at once vanished for doing anything is a negative process which is carried through at the expense of something else so far as that lower determination still continues to appear it has withdrawn into what is without any essential significance just as on the other hand where the lower still predominates while the higher is also present the one coexists in a selfless way alongside of the other while therefore the various ideas falling within a particular religion no doubt exhibit the whole course its forms take the character of each is determined by the particular unity of consciousness and self-consciousness that is to say by the fact that self-consciousness has taken into itself the determination belonging to the object of consciousness has by its own action made that determination altogether its own and knows it to be the essential one as compared with the others the truth of belief in a given determination of the religious spirit shows itself in this that the actual spirit is constituted after the same manner as the form in which spirit beholds itself in religion thus for example the incarnation of god which is found in eastern religion has no truth because the concrete actual spirit of this religion is without the reconciliation this principle implies it is not in place here to return from the totality of specific determinations back to the particular determination and show in what shape the plenitude of all the others is contained within it and within its particular form of religion the higher form when put back under a lower is deprived of its significance for self-conscious spirit belongs to spirit merely in a superficial way and is for it at the level of a presentation the higher form has to be considered in its own peculiar significance and dealt with where it is the principle of a particular religion and is certified and approved by its actual spirit End of section 19. Section 20 of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 2, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter 7a, Subsection A. God as Light. Spirit, as the Absolute Being, which is Self-Consciousness, or the Self-Conscious Absolute Being, which is all truth and knows all reality as itself, is to begin with merely its notion and principle in contrast to the reality which it acquires in the process of its conscious activity and this conception is as contrasted with the clear daylight of that explicit development the darkness and night of its inner life in contrast to the existence of its various moments as independent forms and shapes this notion is the creative secret of its birth this secret has its revelation within itself for existence has its necessary place in this notion because this notion is spirit knowing itself and thus possesses in its own nature the moment of being consciousness and of presenting itself objectively we have here the pure ego which in externalizing itself in seeing itself qua universal object has the certainty of self in other words this object is for the ego the fusion of all thought and all reality when the first and immediate cleavage is made within self-knowing absolute spirit its form assumes that character which belongs to immediate consciousness or to sense certainty it beholds itself in the form of being but not being in the sense of what is without spirit containing only the contingent qualities of sensation the kind of being that belongs solely to sense certainty its being is filled with the content of spirit it also includes within it the form which we found in the case of immediate self-consciousness the form of lord and master with reference to the self-consciousness of spirit which retreats from its object this being having as its content the notion of spirit is then the mode of spirit in relation simply to itself the form of having no special form at all in virtue of this characteristic this mode is the pure all-containing all-suffusing light of the east which preserves itself in its formless indeterminate substantiality 
its counterpart its otherness is the equally simple negative darkness the processes of its own self-abandonment its creations in the unresisting element of its counterpart are bursts of light at the same time in their ultimate simplicity they are its way of becoming something for itself its return from its objective existence streams of fire consuming its embodiment the distinction which it gives itself no doubt thrives abundantly on the substance of existence and grows into and assumes the diverse forms of nature but the essential simplicity of its thought rambles and roves about inconstant and inconsistent enlarges its bounds to measureless extent and its beauty heightened to splendour is lost in its sublimity the content which this state of mere being involves its perceptive activity is therefore an unreal by-play on this substance which merely rises without descending into itself to become subject and secure firmly its distinctions through the self its determinations are merely attributes which do not succeed in attaining independence they remain merely names of the one called by many names this one is clothed with the manifold powers of existence and with the shapes of reality as with a soulless selfless ornament they are merely messengers of its mighty power claiming no will of their own visions of its glory voices in its praise this revel of heaving life must however assume the character of distinctive self-existence and give enduring subsistence to its fleeting forms immediate being in which it places itself over against its own consciousness is itself the negative destructive agency which dissolves its distinctions it is thus in truth the self and spirit therefore passes on to know itself in the form of self pure light scatters its simplicity as an infinity of separate forms and presents itself as an offering to self-existence that the individual may have sustainment in its substance End of section 20. Section 21 of the Phenomenology of Mind, Volume 2, by George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel. Translated by James Black Bailey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by phone. Chapter 7a, Subsection b. Plants and Animals as Objects of Religion self-conscious spirit passing away from abstract formless essence and going into itself or in other words having raised its immediacy to the level of self makes its simple unity assume the character of a manifold of self-existing entities and is the religion of spiritual sense perception here spirit breaks up into an innumerable plurality of weaker and stronger richer and poorer spirits this pantheism which to begin with consists in the quiescent stability of these spiritual atoms passes into a process of active internal hostility the innocence which characterizes the flower and plant religions and which is merely the selfless idea of self gives way to the seriousness of struggling warring life to the guilt of animal religions the quiescence and impotence of merely contemplative individuality pass into the destructive violence of separate self-existence it is of no avail to have removed the lifelessness of abstraction from the things of perception and to have raised them to the level of realities of spiritual perception the animation of this spiritual kingdom has death in the heart of it owing to the fact of determinateness and the inherent negativity which invades and trenches upon their innocent and harmless indifference to one another owing to this determinateness and negativity the dispersion of passive plant forms into manifold entities becomes a hostile process in which the hatred stirred up by their independent self-existence rages and consumes the actual self-consciousness at work in this dispersed and disintegrated spirit takes the form of a multitude of individualized mutually antipathetic folk spirits who fight and hate each other to the death and consciously accept certain specific forms of animals as their essential reality their god for they are nothing else than spirits of animals their animal life separate and cut off from one another and with no universality consciously present in them 
the characteristic of purely negative independent self-existence however consumes itself in this active hatred towards one another and through this process involved in its very principle spirit enters into another shape independent self-existence cancelled and abolished is the form of the object a form which is produced by the self or rather is the self-produced the self-consuming self that is the self that becomes a thing the agent at work therefore retains the upper hand over these animal spirits merely tearing each other to pieces and his action is not merely negative but composed and creative the consciousness of spirit is thus now the process which is above and beyond the immediate inherent universal nature as well as transcends the abstract self-existence in isolation since the implicit inherent nature is relegated through opposition to the level of a specific character it is no longer the proper form of absolute spirit but a reality which its consciousness finds lying over against itself as an ordinary existing fact and cancels at the same time this consciousness is not merely this negative cancelling self-existent being but produces its own objective idea of itself self-existence put forth in the form of an object this process of production is all the same not yet perfect production it is a conditioned activity the forming of a given material End of section 21section twenty two of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone chapter seven a subsection c the artificer spirit then here takes the form of the artificer and this action when producing itself as object but without having as yet grasped the thought of itself is an instinctive kind of working like bees building their cells the first form because immediate has the abstract character of understanding and the work accomplished is not yet in itself endued with spirit the crystals of pyramids and obelisks simple combinations of straight lines with even surfaces and equal relations of parts in which incommensurability of curvature is set aside these are the works produced in strict geometrical form by this artificer owing to the purely abstract intelligible nature of the form it is not in itself the true significance of the form it is not the spiritual self thus either the works produced only receive spirit into them as an alien departed spirit one that has forsaken its living suffusion and permeation with reality and being itself dead enters into these lifeless crystals or they take up an external relation to spirit as something which is itself external and not there as spirit they are related to it as to the orient light which throws its significance on them the separation of elements from which spirit as artificer starts the separation of the implicit essential nature which becomes the material it works upon and independent self-existence which is the aspect of self-consciousness at work this division has become objective in the result achieved its further endeavour has to be directed to cancelling and doing away with the separation of soul and body it must strive to clothe and give embodied shape to soul per se and endow the body with soul the two aspects since they are brought closer to one another bear towards each other in this condition the character of ideally presented spirit and of enveloping shell spirit's oneness with itself contains this opposition of individuality and universality since the aspects of the work produced become closer by performance of it there comes about thereby at the same time the other fact that the work gets nearer to the self-consciousness performing it and that the latter attains in the work knowledge of itself as it truly is in this way however the work merely constitutes to begin with the abstract side of the activity of spirit which does not yet perceive the content of this activity within itself but in its work which is a thing the artificer as such spirit in its entirety has not yet appeared the artificer is still the inner hidden reality 
which qua entire is present only as broken up into active self-consciousness and the object it has produced the surrounding habitation external reality which to begin with is raised merely to the abstract form of the understanding is worked up by the artificer and made into a more animated form the artificer employs plant life for this purpose which is no longer sacred as in the previous case of inactive impotent pantheism rather the artificer who holds himself to be the self-existent reality takes that plant life as something to be used and degrades it to an external aspect to the level of an ornament but it is not turned to use without some alteration for the worker producing the self-conscious form destroys at the same time the transitoriness inherently characteristic of the immediate existence of this life and brings its organic forms nearer to the more exact and more universal forms of thought the organic form which left to itself grows and thrives in particularity being on its side subjugated by the form of thought elevates in turn these straight-lined and level shapes into more animated roundedness a blending which becomes the root of free architecture this dwelling the aspect of the universal element or inorganic nature of spirits also includes within it now a form of individuality which brings nearer to actuality the spirit that was formerly separated from existence and external or internal thereto and thus makes the work to accord more with active self-consciousness the worker lays hold first of all on the form of self-existence in general on the forms of animal life that he is no longer directly aware of himself in animal life he shows by the fact that in reference to this he constitutes himself the productive force and knows himself in it as being his own work whereby productive force at the same time is one which is superseded and becomes the hieroglyphic symbol of another meaning the hieroglyph of a thought hence also this force is no longer solely and entirely used by the worker but becomes blended with the shape embodying thought with the human form still the work lacks the form and existence where self as self appears it also fails to express in its very nature that it includes within itself an inner meaning it lacks language the element in which the sense and meaning contained are actually present the work done therefore even when quite purified of the animal aspect and bearing the form and shape of self-consciousness alone is still the silent soundless form which needs the rays of the rising sun in order to have a sound which when produced by light is even then merely noise and not speech shows merely an outer self not the inner self contrasted with this outer self of the form and shape stands the other form which indicates that it has in it an inner being nature turning back into its essential being degrades its multiplicity of life ever individualizing itself and confounding itself in its own process to the level of an external encasing shell which is the covering for the inner being and still this inner being is primarily mere darkness the unmoved the black formless stone both representations contain inwardness and existence the two moments of spirit and both kinds of manifestation contain both moments at once in a relation of opposition the self both as inward and as outward both have to be united the soul of the statue in human form does not yet come out of the inner being is not yet speech objective existence of self which is inherently internal and the inner being of multiform existence is still without voice or sound still draws no distinctions within itself and is still separated from its outer being to which all distinctions belong the artificer therefore combines both by blending the forms of nature and self-consciousness and these ambiguous beings a riddle to themselves the conscious struggling with what has no consciousness the simple inner with the multiform outer the darkness of thought mated with clearness of expression these break out into the language of a wisdom that is darkly deep and difficult to understand with the production of this work the instinctive method of working ceases which in contrast to self-consciousness produced a work devoid of consciousness 
for here the activity of the artificer which constitutes self-consciousness comes face to face with an inner being equally self-conscious and giving itself expression he has therein raised himself by his work up to the point where his conscious life breaks asunder where spirit greets spirit in this unity of self-conscious spirit with itself so far as it is aware of being embodiment and object of its own consciousness its blending and mingling with the unconscious condition of immediate forms of nature become purified these monsters in form and shape word and deed are resolved and dissolved into a shape which is spiritual an outer which has entered into itself an inner which expresses itself out of itself and in itself they pass into thought which brings forth itself preserves the shape and form suited to thought and is transparent existence spirit is artist end of section twenty two section twenty three of the phenomenology of mind volume two by george wilhelm friedrich hegel translated by james black bailey this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phone chapter seven b religion in the form of art spirit has raised the shape in which it is object for its own consciousness into the form of consciousness itself and spirit sets such a form before itself the artificer has given up the external synthesizing activity that blending of the heterogeneous forms of thought and nature when the shape has gained the form of self-conscious activity the artificer has become a spiritual workman if we next ask what the actual spirit is which finds in the religion of art the consciousness of its absolute it turns out that this is the ethical or objective spirit this spirit is not merely the universal substance of all individuals but when this substance is said to have as an objective fact for actual consciousness the form of consciousness this amounts to saying that the substance which is individualized is known by the individuals within it as their proper essence and their own achievement it is for them neither the light of the world in whose unity the self-existence of self-consciousness is contained only negatively only transitorily and beholds the lord and master of its reality nor is it the restless waste and destruction of hostile nations nor their subjection to castes which together constitute the semblance of organization of a completed whole where however the universal freedom of the individuals concerned is wanting rather this spirit is a free nation in which custom and order constitute the common substance of all whose reality and existence each and every one knows to be his own will and his own deed the religion of the ethical spirit however raises it above its actual realization and is the return from its objectivity into pure knowledge of itself since an ethically constituted nation lives in direct unity with its own substance and does not contain the principle of pure individualism of self-consciousness the religion characteristic of its sphere first appears in complete form in severance from its stable security for the reality of the ethical substance rests partly on its quiet unchangeableness as contrasted with the absolute process of self-consciousness and consequently on the fact that this self-consciousness has not yet left its serene life of customary convention and its confident security therein and gone into itself partly again that reality rests on its organization into a plurality of rights and duties as also on its organized distribution into groups of stations and classes each with its particular way of acting which cooperates to form the whole and hence rests on the fact that the individual is contented with the limitation of his existence and has not yet grasped the unrestricted thought of his free self but that serene immediate confidence in the substance of this ethical life returns to trust in self and to certainty of self and the plurality of rights and duties as well as the restricted particular action this involves is the same dialectic process in the sphere of the ethical life as the plurality of things and their various qualities 
a process which only comes to rest and stability in the simplicity of spirit certain of self the complete fulfilment of the ethical life in free self-consciousness and the destined consummation schicksal, of the ethical world are therefore found when individuality has entered into itself the condition is one of absolute levity on the part of the ethical spirit it has dissipated and resolved into itself all the firmly established distinctions constituting its own stability and the separate components of its own articulated organization and being perfectly sure of itself has attained to boundless cheerfulness of heart and the freest enjoyment of itself this simple certainty of spirit within itself has a double meaning it is quiet stability and solid truth as well as absolute unrest and the disappearance of the ethical order it turns round however into the latter for the truth of the ethical spirit lies primarily just in this substantial objectivity and trust in which the self does not think of itself as free individual and where the self therefore in this inner subjectivity in becoming a free self falls to the ground since then its trust is broken and the substance of the nation cracked spirit which was the connecting medium of the unstable extremes has now come forward as an extreme that of self-consciousness taking itself to be essential and ultimate this is spirit certain within itself which mourns over the loss of its world and now produces out of the abstraction of self its own essential being raised far above actual reality at such an epoch art in absolute form comes on the scene at the earlier stage it is instinctive in its operation being absorbed and steeped in existence it works out of and works into this element it does not find its substance in the free life of an ethical order and hence too the self-operating does not consist of free spiritual activity later on spirit goes beyond art in order to gain its higher manifestation that is that of being not merely the substance born and produced out of the self but of being in its manifestation object of this self it seeks at that higher level not merely to bring forth itself out of its own notion but to have its very notion as its form so that the notion and the work of art produced may know each other reciprocally as one and the same since then the ethical substance has withdrawn from its objective existence into its bare self-consciousness this is the aspect of the notion or the activity with which spirit brings itself forward as object it is pure form because the individual in ethical obedience and service has so worked off every unconscious existence and every fixed determination as the substance has itself become this fluid and undifferentiated entity this form is the night in which the substance was betrayed and made itself subject it is out of this night of pure certainty of self that the ethical spirit rises again in a shape freed from nature and its own immediate existence the existence of the pure notion into which spirit has fled from its bodily shape is an individual which spirit selects as the vessel for its sorrow spirit acts in this individual as his universal and his power from which he suffers violence as his element of pathos by having given himself over to which his self-consciousness loses freedom but that positive power belonging to the universal is overcome by the pure self of the individual the negative power this pure activity conscious of its inalienable force wrestles with the unembodied essential being becoming its master this negative activity has turned the element of pathos into its own material and given itself its content and this unity comes out as a work universal spirit individualized and consciously presented end of section twenty three